hearted. Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. Are you grieving over joys departed? Tell it to Jesus alone. a friend or brother, tell it to Jesus alone. Do the tears flow down your cheeks unbidden? Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. Have you sins that to men's eyes are hidden? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. He is a friend that's well known. You've no other such a friend or brother. Tell it to Jesus alone. Are you troubled? Are you troubled at the thought of dying? Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. For Christ's coming kingdom are you sighing? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. He is a friend that's well known. You've no other such a friend or brother. Tell it to Jesus alone. Amen. Well, welcome back this evening. I hope you had a good afternoon. Maybe got a little nap in, enjoyed that uh, beautiful weather, and uh, we're thankful to be back tonight to be able to God, be in God's house. All right. Robert, would you mind opening us in a word of prayer this evening? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to be able to be in your house, Lord, and we pray that uh, the phone service uh, goes according to your plan, Lord, and uh, we just thank you for this music that uh, we have, Lord, and uh, it goes all to you, Lord, and we just thank you for that. Lord, uh, we pray for the message tonight, and uh, we pray that the people who are not here Amen. You may be seated while the choir sings.
right, take your hymn books if you would. Stand and turn to page 652. Take the name of Jesus with you. Let's stand to sing. Take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe. It will joy and comfort give you. Take it then where'er you go. Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. Take the name of Jesus ever as a shield from every snare. If temptations round you gather, breathe that holy name in prayer. Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. Precious name, oh how sweet, Hope of earth and joy of heaven. At the name of Jesus bowing, falling prostrate at his feet. King of kings in heaven will crown him when our journey is complete. Precious name, oh how sweet. Hope of earth and joy of heaven, precious name, oh how sweet. Hope of earth and joy of heaven. Amen. Good singing. Men, would you please come forward? We'll take tonight's tithes and offerings. And Jake, would you mind leading us in prayer for our offerings tonight? Amen. You may be seated. joy. Well, uh, time to see how attentive you've been, all right? Uh, does anybody notice any changes in the auditorium? Has anybody noticed anything different up here? We got some new handrails up here, and uh, Mark Campbell helped us with those, and uh, beautiful, and more than that, they're sturdy, which is good, and uh, we appreciate him doing that for us. That's a, a big help to those in the choir and uh, uh, those that would need it, so thank you, Mark, for doing that for us. Uh, also, I meant to mention, uh, as we were doing offering, and I forgot, uh, but keep Angie in prayer, if you would. She is uh, still having a, a rough time and, and still feeling pretty sick, so uh, if you would, as you pray this week, keep her... Uh, and your thoughts and your prayers, all right? 
Well, tonight after the evening service, uh, after our service tonight, we're going to have a meeting for those that either work with the three through six-year-olds or would like to work with the three through six-year-olds. And uh, we'll just meet up here in the choir loft, if that's all right with Renee. And uh, uh, just going to go over some things, make sure everybody's on the same page. Uh, she's transitioning in and taking over that ministry, and we appreciate it. Uh, but just want to make sure everybody's on the same page with that. And then this coming Thursday on the 5th, the senior saints are going to be having an outing, and they'll be heading to the old Richmond Inn. They'll be going to the Warm Glow as well, and we will meet here at noon. If you wouldn't mind, sign up on the back, and there's a sign-up sheet there. That'll help her uh, have a head count so they can have the spots ready for us when we get over there, all right? Uh, and then, reminder, we went over this this morning, but uh, Joey is going to come and candidate next weekend. And so uh, be aware of that, be praying for that, that God would give good direction. And uh, because of that, we're going to move our communion service from the 8th next Sunday, and we're going to push it back one week. And so we'll do that on the 15th. And so uh, that day we'll have communion in the morning and then a kickball and cookout in the evening. Okay, so uh, thank you, guys. I appreciate it. <laughs> and they say dreams don't come true. So we got it, all right? So, uh, so we'll do that next Sunday night after the evening ser or during the evening service. And uh, what, what I'm thinking for that night is uh, I, I'm thinking uh, we'll do a gospel message that night. Give you an opportunity. If you have anyone that you've been uh, praying about and, and want to invite, that'd be a good night to bring them. And we'll just take, uh, it'll be short. It'll be 10, 15 minutes, and we'll present the gospel. We won't be pushy. Uh, but we want people to know. And so uh, use that as a tool, invite people, and uh, then we'll have a good time of fellowship that night as well. All right? All right. Well, I think that is all I have for you tonight. And so we'll have one more song, and then Elizabeth, you sing it for us? All right, that'll be good. Sometimes I just quietly praise the Lord. I don't have to do the announcement. That's <laughs> 461, you can remain seated. I will sing the wondrous story. 461. I will sing a wondrous story of the Christ who died for me, how he left his home in glory for the cross of Calvary. Yes, I'll sing a wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory gathered by the crystal sea. I was lost, but Jesus found me, found the sheep that went astray. Through his loving arms around me, drew me back into his way. Yes, I'll sing a wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory, gathered by the crystal sea. On the last now. He will keep me till the river rolls its waters at my feet. Then he'll bear me safely over when my journey is complete. Yes, I'll sing a wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory gathered by the crystal sea. Good singing, Stephen.
that tonight. That's a good song, good message, and I appreciate you, you doing that for us. Would you turn with me to Acts chapter 18 tonight? Acts chapter 18. And I mentioned this morning, my, my heartbeat this week has been on missions and, and thinking about missions and uh, hopefully to kind of refocus us today as we think of missions. And uh, if you think of missions, probably the greatest missionary to ever live would be the Apostle Paul. And uh, the missionary journeys he took, the impact he had in the world, are, are still being felt today as you trace back what he did. Uh, but even the greatest missionary of all time struggled. You know, he, he had times in his missionary journeys where it was discouraging, where, where he faced things that he, he was tempted to quit. And uh, one of those times would be in Acts chapter 18. And I'd like to look at this passage tonight. I'd like to look at the struggles of a missionary. So let's look at Acts chapter 18, and we'll actually do 11 verses here, verse 1 through verse 11. It says this, it says, After these things Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth, and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontius, lately from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timothy were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit, and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean from henceforth, I will go unto the Gentiles. And he departed. Thence he entered into a certain man's house named Justus. One that worshiped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and the many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by the vision, Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace, for I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months teaching the Word of God among them. Let's pray, and then I'd like to take a few moments and look at the struggles 
that missionary space. Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for our, uh, our, our fellow laborer and Daniel Arnold that was able to be with us today. And Lord, we lift him up in prayer. We pray that you'll be with him as he's on furlough, that you would uh, rejuvenate him and, and give him some rest and uh, encourage him as he gets ready to head back to the field. I pray that you'll be with all of our missionaries tonight as they're doing your work in uh, places all over the world, that you would just give them power and that you would use their ministries. And I pray that you'd give us a heart for missions. I pray that you'd give us a burden for souls. And I thank you for all you've done for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If I say the word struggle, you, you know what I mean when I use that word, right? Sometimes we have days where we're just struggling, where we're trying, but it doesn't seem like we're quite successful or things just aren't quite going our way. And uh, I, I, I came home, this has probably been a couple months ago now, and uh, I walked in our house and uh, a whole scene unveiled in front of me. And uh, what had happened, I had not been here for the beginning of the story, but it was pretty obvious what had happened. Uh, Karis was in our laundry room, and uh, she was in there, and she was arranging some things or whatever. And, and up on the top shelf, we have like three shelves, and above head level uh, up there, I had a couple of cans of the uh, insulation foam cans. You guys ever had that before? Uh, incredible stuff. I mean, you can fix anything with it. Duct tape, super glue, and spray foam. That's all you need. You can, you can build a house with this stuff. And uh, the stuff, it, it, just, it just keeps coming and expanding. If you've ever worked with it, it's incredibly sticky and all that. Well, it was on the top shelf in this room, and uh, apparently Karis had bumped it or something like that, and it fell off, and it had fallen on something sharp, and it had punctured it. And uh, <laughs> Jake's getting too much joy out of this. And, it's, <laughs> and uh, uh, this thing, uh, have you ever seen like a, like a two liter when you shake it up and then open it and it just goes nuts? She said that's what happened, and I believe it, because it looked like an a, a insulation massacre in there. <laughs> and she had, she had picked this thing up, and uh, like she, I guess she was in shock and trying to figure out what to do with it, and it's shooting everywhere, you know, as she's doing it. And she took it all the way out to the, to the outside, and by that point, the foam was gone. All the foam was in the house. And uh, I walk in, and that's about the time I see her. <laughs> she's covered in foam. The house is covered in foam. And uh, she looks at me, and she, she goes, I'm struggling. <laughs> <laughs> You get what I mean when I say struggling, right? Now, Paul and missionaries, you know, in the missionary life, the missionary life is not an easy life. It, it can be a struggle at times. You know, the adversity they face, the challenges they face, it, it, it can be a lot of opposition. And what I want to look at tonight are some struggles, some challenges that missionaries face so that, one, that we can know how to encourage them, but, but even more practically, we all are missionaries. Me, me and Norma were talking this morning after the service, and, and she was talking about how the moment that we leave the church, we are walking into the mission field. We've all seen that before. We've all heard that phrase before. And, and the struggle that missionaries on a foreign field face are the same struggles that we face. Now, they may not look the same. They may not be as intense, but they're the same struggles that we face as we look to be missionaries for the Lord. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to give you five struggles that mi missionaries face, and then I would like to give you five encouragements that we also find in this passage. So we find ourselves, Paul is in a place called Corinth, and the first struggle I see that he has is he has the struggle of a competing culture. The struggle of a competing culture. Paul, when he went on his missionary journeys, he consistently found himself in environments that were very ungodly, very unmoral, uh, very... Uh, counter to the things of God. And none of those places would be more so than this place called Corinth. Corinth has been compared by many preachers to our current day city of Las Vegas. It was a, a, a city of a uh, uh, lot of wickedness and morality. They say that the city of Corinth was a new city. In the mid-100s, the city had been destroyed and the Roman government realized it was a very strategic city, a very strategic place, and so they rebuilt this city, and so by the time Paul gets here, it's a very new city, it's a, a place that is flowing with a lot of business, and a lot of uh, uh, action is going on here, but it is also a place that is just infiltrated with wickedness. Corinth was a place where sin was celebrated. It was a place where, where people thought sin was okay, and they actually encouraged sin, and and sin was celebrated in the place called Corinth. Does that sound familiar to us? Are we not living in a culture where sin is celebrated? 
You know, it used to be in our culture, there was sin, but, but it wasn't praised the way it is today. Today, sin is praised on TV networks and, and news programs. And if you were to say anything against sin, all of a sudden, you're the bad guy. We live in a culture that is competing against the things of God. And Paul, he found himself in a situation where he was, he, he was the only gospel presence, him and his team, in the light of a culture that was competing against the things of God. You know, when you find yourself isolated and marginalized in a, in a city like this, what do you do? The temptation when you face this type of culture is to get quiet and to blend in and to not make a scene. But Paul, he did the opposite. Paul was a guy who was consistently making a scene. He, he, he didn't just blend in with the rest of his culture. When I was uh, in college, uh, we, we all... We all do things we regret, okay? So let me just preface this right up front, all right? When I was in, in college, I had a few friends that were Ohio State fans, okay? And so, uh, I, I, like I said, we all have regrets, right? <laughs> and uh, it, it was fall time, it was our, our fall semester, and my two friends who are Ohio State fans, we were pretty close to the University of Wisconsin, and uh, that weekend, Ohio State was coming to play Wisconsin. Uh, up, up in uh, Madison. And so they said, hey, do you want to go with us? And I thought, yeah, I'd never been to a big game. And, and it was a big game. I think at that time, Ohio State was number one in the nation and, and Wisconsin was number 11 in the nation. So if you're a sports fan, you, you, you get how exciting it was, right? And so we, we get ready. We get ready to head out to the game. And, and, and they kind of stop me at the door and they say, uh, they say, you're not going like that. And I was like, what do, what do you mean? I just had my normal clothes on and they, they pulled out an Ohio State t-shirt. Don't tell the Allens, okay? All right, I don't think they're here tonight, but they said, they said, they said you, you got to wear this. And so peer pressure, I'm telling you, bad friends lead to bad decisions, guys, all right? So they said, you got you to wear the T-shirt. I said, all right, fine. So I put the T-shirt on, and we, uh, we drove, went downtown Madison, and it's the college hub and all that. And uh, I don't know if you've been in this type of situation like that, but college fans are very passionate about their team, and college kids are very passionate people. And so we, we park the car and we start walking up to the stadium and uh, all the frat houses and everybody, everybody's just heckling us because we got these Ohio State things on, right? And they're making fun of us and booing us. I don't know if you've ever been booed before. It does not feel good, okay? <laughs> and uh, we, we make our way to the stadium. We go to the game and, 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 and nobody likes us because we got this thing on. And so uh, about midway through the first quarter, you know what I did? I had a jacket with me. I took that jacket, and I put the jacket on, and I zipped it up, right? <laughs> and uh, the, the, the guys didn't know who I was anymore, right? And, uh, you know, that, that's the temptation. When you're in a counterculture, the temptation is just to cover it up, to hide it. The, the temptation is just to blend in and get real quiet. And, and, and at your school or at your work, the temptation is just not to say anything, don't make any waves, and, and, and to just blend in. And Paul, his first struggle was that he was in a competing culture. The second thing I see as a struggle for Paul was, number two, the struggle of increasing opposition. The struggle of increasing opposition. Here, Paul is in his second missionary journey, but what you have to realize is this was not his first stop on the journey. Think through what he has been through leading up to this point. He started out his missionary journey. He went to a place called Galatia. Do you remember Paul's stop in Galatia? Do you remember what happened to him there? Do you remember how he was arrested, and then he was falsely ac accused, and then he was put in jail, and then he was beaten, and then he was whipped on his back, and then he was put in a maximum security prison? Do you remember that? And then after he was released, he moves on from Galatia, and then he goes to a place called Thessalonica. Once he gets to Thessalonica, Th Thessalonica it all starts again. Here he starts to share the gospel, and people start to get saved, but, but pretty soon people don't like what he's doing, and so a riot ensues, and, and eventually people come to the house he's staying at with the goal of killing Paul. And he's able to slip out and undetected and, and flee for his life, and so then he moves on to a place called Berea. Do you remember when he's in Berea? Again, the gospel is going forward and good things are happening, but then people from Thessalonica come, and they pursue Paul, and they start a new riot, and he has to flee again. Then he goes to Athens, and in Athens he is all alone, and he preaches the gospel. And do you remember how they mocked him and made fun of him because he believed in the resurrection? He believed in life after death. And, and every place that Paul went, there was increasing opposition. Do you ever feel that way? Do you, do you ever feel like you're the only one in your school that is following God? 
Do you ever feel like you're the only one at your work or in your family? And, and it seems like when you walk around, everyone else just gets quiet because they can't talk about the things they usually talk about when you're there. Paul, he felt, found himself with the struggle of increasing opposition. The third thing I see from Paul, his third struggle, is the struggle of a hurting heart. The struggle of a hurting heart. You see, Paul lived with a burden on his heart. He, he lived with the joy of Christ for sure, but he also lived with a burden for those that, that he wanted to see saved and he wanted to see come to the gospel. And yet the people that Paul had a burden for were the people that were rejecting Christ. And he, he carried this weight, this burden with him. You see, Paul had a burden for the Jewish people. Every city he went to, he would first go to the synagogue and he would preach to the Jews. And, and he had a burning desire to see them saved. He says in Romans 10, he says this, he says, My heart's desire and prayer for Israel is that they might be saved. You know, if anyone should have accepted the gospel, it should have been the Jews. They had the Old Testament, which had the, the prophecies and the predictions of the Messiah. And they should have been able to look at Christ, and they should have been able to look at the Old Testament scriptures, and they should have seen that he fulfilled those prophecies perfectly. And if anyone should have accepted Christ, it should have been the Jews. And yet many of them rejected Christ. And Paul says that was a burden on him. He, he lived with a hurting heart. I wonder, who is it for you that you are burdened for? Who is it in your life that, that there is just a, a burning, hurting heart for their life? Maybe you've been praying for them for years and they just haven't gotten saved. Or, or maybe you've been praying that they would get right with God and get back in church and start living the right way. And, and it seems like they just aren't doing what you're asking God to do in their life. And, and there's this burning hurt, this desire for them to be saved. Uh, I have many teenagers that have come through our ministry over the years and they are still on my prayer sheet. If you were to go to my, my notebook where I do my devotions and look to the back where I, I pray for people, you would see names on there that they haven't been on our youth group for a long time. And they're not where they need to be with God. They're not walking with God. And, and you have people like that too. It just, it, it burdens your heart, doesn't it? And Paul, he had this burden for these people. He had a hurting heart for them. And that can be discouraging. The fourth struggle I see was the struggle of inadequate resources. The struggle of inadequate resources. It says in the ver first three verses that when Paul came to town, one of the things he had to do was he had to find a job. He, he didn't have the resources he needed. He, he went to the field uh, under-supported. So he had a couple of areas where he had inadequate resources. First of all, he lacked finances. It says that he had to become a tent maker in order to be able to serve God and do his calling and at the same time support himself. Like we said this morning, missions cost money, doesn't it? It costs money to rent a place to live and to eat food and all that sort of thing. And Paul, he found himself where a constant struggle in his life was financial resources. Not only were financial resources a lack for him, but also he lacked helpers. He lacked the people that he wanted around him to accomplish the mission that he was called to. He was consistently through his letters writing and, and asking for someone to come and to give him help and to give him some relief. Uh, you ever done that? You, you ever do a job and it was like a two or three person job and uh, you're doing it as a one person person? You ever had that happen before? Uh, you, you see it nowadays at restaurants, don't you? You know, they, they, they have all these people to serve and only a few people work and that sort of thing. We went to uh, the missions trip uh, what has it been, three weeks ago now? We left on that trip, and uh, we stopped on the way up. We stopped in Lafayette, and we pulled our bus in, and we pulled our van in, and uh, one of the only places that was open to go into was an Arby's there. So we stopped, and we go to this Arby's, and uh, they see this busload coming in, and the panic on these people's faces <laughs> was unbelievable. And, and we get in our line, we form our line, and then one of the ladies comes out, and she goes and she locks the door to make sure no more people can come in because it was just too much, you know, to, to handle. And uh, so, so what we did is we, we went on to Minnesota, and then the next Friday we came back, we, we stopped at the same Arby's. It was one of the only places. <laughs> and, and so uh, just to mess with them when I left, I said, see you next Friday, just to, just to <laughs> mess with them a little bit. But uh, Paul, he found himself where he had this large ministry to do, 
and this big burden for these people, and, and, and he saw all the potential and all the work that could be done, and, and he's just saying, I, I don't have the people I need. I don't have the finances I need, and that can be discouraging. Paul, he found himself with the struggle of inadequate resources. And then the, finally, the fifth struggle I see, and then we'll get to the encouraging side of the message, is number five, I see the struggle of a repeating situation. I see the struggle of a repeating situation. You know, all the struggles we've looked at so far are from Acts chapter 18. And they're in that passage, and that's a snapshot, and that's good. But, but what's interesting is if you look at the previous chapters, all of these struggles are being repeated uh, town after town after town after town. And it's not that he just had to face these struggles one time. It was the repetitiveness of these struggles, the waves of these struggles that are the temptation to wear us down. It can be easy to face a challenge for one time, but to face it again and again can become discouraging. Caleb. I like picking on Caleb. In youth group, he's my favorite guy to pick on, so we do it a lot, all right? Caleb, how, how much do you think you could bench press? Not very much. <laughs> We're not going to test it, so you can, I mean, you can make yourself look good right now. You want to pick a number? 100 pounds? 100 pounds? No? Okay. <laughs> 50 pounds? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you could do 50 pounds, all right? All right, so let's say, let's say, Caleb, we bring him up here. Let's say we have a, a bench press and the bench all set up, and we have 50 pounds set up on the, the bar, and he goes up, and uh, he, he does the first press, and no problem, right? And the, the girls are impressed, and his, his muscles are bulging and all that sort of thing. And the first one, he just kills it, right? And then he goes for the second one. He still does pretty good. And the third one and the fourth one, and he, he, he's doing good. He gets to about the sixth or seven. What starts to happen? Those arms start to shake a little bit, right? They start to slow down a little bit. You get to the 10th one, and now it's a real struggle. You get to the 12th one, well, he doesn't get to the 12th one, all right? You made it to 11. That's pretty good. What, what happens? At the beginning, you can handle it fine, but it's the repetition that makes you tired. It's the repetition that, that takes your hope and your joy. And some of you are facing situations in your life that if it was a one-time thing, that would be one thing. But the fact that it seems there's no hope, that this marriage we're struggling with and it seems like it, it never gets any better or this class I just can't seem to pass no matter how many times I take it or, or whatever it is, the repetition of a trial increases the temptation to quit. Here Paul, he has faced the same situation time after time after time and many people would quit because of that. But Paul didn't. Paul, he, he continued steadfastly. He continued to be faithful. So let me give you five encouragements. We, we've seen the struggles that a missionary faces. Let, let me also show you how Paul stayed encouraged and how he stayed faithful to his missionary calling. The first thing I see that is encouragement is, number one, the encouragement of a strategic relationship. The encouragement of a strategic relationship. It says in, in verse 2, that Paul, he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born of Pontius, lately come from Italy with his wife, Priscilla. And skip down to verse 3. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. What is the primary way that God encourages his people? The primary way God encourages his people is through people. God uses people to encourage his people. And what does God do for Paul here? As he finds himself in all the opposition, all the discouragement of this situation, what God does is God gives him fellow laborers in this couple called Aquila and Priscilla. You say, who are Aquila and Priscilla? Well, they're Jews, first of all. So that means that him and Aquila and Priscilla would have the same diet. They like the same food, so they have that in common, right? It says that Aquila and Priscilla are tent makers, and so they have that hobby in common. They have that, uh, that uh, common uh, interest and activity in common. These people were also Christians. We don't know if they got saved by meeting Paul or if they were saved previous to meeting Paul, but they could talk about the things of the Lord together and, and encourage each other in the Lord. God brought Aquila and Priscilla into, into Paul's life to encourage him. It's interesting, if you look in Romans chapter 16, Paul says this about Aquila and Priscilla. He says, they laid down 
their necks for me. To us, that phrase doesn't mean much, but basically what the phrase means is this. He means they are the best friends that anyone could ever ask for. You know, these are the people that stuck with me and were faithful to me, and they encouraged me. And the first encouragement I want to tell you is this. We need to have strategic relationships. If we're going to stay encouraged for the Lord, we need each other. We, we are meant to be a church family and a church body that encourages one another. I don't know how people who don't have a church family go through storms in life. Uh, I was thinking about that today. You know, we, our family kind of went through a storm the last several weeks. And it's unbelievable the encouragement that a church family brings to that type of situation. And unless you've been through that, you, you, you don't quite understand how much of an encouragement you are. But the first thing we need to be encouraged is we need each other. We need strategic relationships. God gave Paul strategic friends, strategic relationships to encourage him. The second thing I see is that he had the encouragement of following godly habits. He had, first of all, the, the encouragement of strategic relationships, but number two, the encouragement of following godly habits. Paul is in Corinth. He's there by himself, really, and, and he has all this opposition. So what does he do? He does what he always does. He goes to the synagogue. He preaches to the Jews. He explains that Christ is the, the Messiah, and he presents the gospel to them. He, he did what he knew was right to do. When we're facing opposition and we're struggling in our Christian life, one of the things we need to fall back on is our godly habits. Continue to do what we know to do that is right. Here, Paul, his godly habits, he was faithful to them. You know, when, when we go through trials, that is not the time to quit doing what we know to do is right. When we go through trials, that's not the time to quit being in church and around other people. That's not the time to quit being in God's word. It's not the time to quit praying. The godly habits of Paul helped him through these struggles. Third of all, the encouragement of a healthy perspective. So the encouragement of strategic relationships, the encouragement of following godly habits, and number three, the encouragement of healthy perspective. Look at verse six with me, if you would. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth, I will go unto the Gentiles. So Paul preaches to the Jews in the synagogue, and, and they don't like what Paul has to say. They reject Christ, and, and what does Paul do? Instead of being discouraged by the results, he goes on and he keeps serving. Hey, here's the principle I think we can get. In our service to the Lord, we do not need to attach our joy to results. We need to attach our joy to obedience. You know, when it comes to witnessing, it's, it's not our responsibility what the results turn out to be. Our responsibility is to be faithful to what God has called us to do. It doesn't matter if you go and, and you witness to someone and, and if they reject you, that, does not, that should not be the end-all, be-all of why we do it. Ultimately, we do it because we are obeying the Lord, because we are serving the Lord. Look how, how God describes it. He says that the people that rejected the gospel, they opposed themselves. In other words, it had nothing to do with the person presenting the gospel. It had everything to do with the person that rejected it and God. That's between them and God. And our job is simply to be the messengers. And, and whether it's rejected or whether it's recepted, we don't tie our joy to that. We tie our joy to the fact that we are obedient to him. Can I, can I point out something interesting in this passage that I, I had not noticed before? There's a, a guy named, there's a guy named uh, Crispus, okay? He was the chief of the synagogue. Have you ever noticed this before? And Paul, he was preaching and teaching in the synagogue. And it says that, that the Jews rejected him and, and basically kicked him out of the synagogue. And so Paul moves on to this other little house to preach and teach. But then after he's kicked out, did you notice who got saved? The chief of the synagogue. You, you know what's interesting to me about that? It, is it shows me that our timing is not always God's timing. Paul had preached the gospel to this guy, and he had heard it in the synagogue, and he didn't get saved then. But later on, he did end up getting saved. And just because we preach the gospel and give it to someone and they reject it at first doesn't mean that God is done working. And Paul, he had a healthy perspective. He didn't find his joy linked to his results, but to his obedience. And let me give you two more encouragements. Number four, the encouragement of unchanging truth. The encouragement of unchanging truth. You know, Paul, 
had been rejected. And uh, the temptation we can see from what God told him later on, the temptation was for him to stop preaching and to stop giving the gospel and to just kind of hunker down in fear. But what he did instead was he said, I'm not going to live by my feelings. I'm going to live by the truth of the word of God. You know, our feelings change, but the word of God never changes. If we base our life on our feelings, we're going to be all over the map. But the word of God never changes. If we want direction in our life, if we want principles that we can base our life on, it it needs to be from the word of God. If we only serve God or do what's right when we feel like it, there's going to be a lot of times we're not serving God. But Paul, he said, I'm not going to base my life on changing emotions. I'm going to base my life on unchanging truth. And then finally, and kind of the, the, the pinnacle of this passage, the last encouragement I see is the encouragement of a personal visit. The encouragement of a personal visit. Paul has gone through all of this, and, and apparently he's discouraged, and he's afraid, and, and he doesn't want to go through the beatings and the prison and everything that he's gone through so far in this trip. And, and, and what God does for him is that God comes to him in verse 9, and, and God says this to him. He says, Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. Here, Paul the fact that God tells him to not be afraid indicates that Paul was currently afraid. The fact that God tells Paul to go and to speak the gospel means that he is tempted to not go and speak the gospel. And God says, you need to not be afraid. You need to be continuing and sharing the gospel. Why? Because he says in verse 10, he says, for I am with thee. I, uh, I didn't have time to study it out this week, but But something I would like to look at sometime is I would like to go through scripture and look at how many times does God make the commandment to fear not and also accompany it with the promise that he is there. Because I remember I was studying in Mark a a while back for one of our messages and and God told told the disciples, he said, fear not for it's me. Uh, I think of Joshua and, and in Joshua he tells him not to be afraid because I will take care of you. And here he comes to Paul and he tells Paul, hey, don't be afraid because I am here. The fact that we have the presence of God is what alleviates fear and gives encouragement in the Christian life. Here, God comes to Paul and he tells Paul, he says, I am with you. And if you're a Christian, the same thing's true for you. Whether you're 13 or, or, or whether, you're, whether you're, you're 83, it doesn't matter. God is with us. We have a God who is a personal God. It's interesting that Paul never forgets this promise. If you were to look over into 2 Timothy Timothy is one of Paul's favorite people. And as he writes at the end of 2 Timothy, Paul is in a pit and and his body is giving out. He's only got a few more days left until he's going to be executed. And and he tells Timothy in this letter, he says, he says, at my first trial, he said, no man stood with me. He said, all I needed was one person to come and to to vouch for me or to to, to let the the ruler know that I was okay. He He said, nobody stood with me. He said, I was all alone. But do you remember what he said after that? He says, nevertheless, the Lord was with me, and he strengthened me. And the truth that he learned here in this passage, he, he never forgot that. And the fact that God was with him gave him encouragement as he went through the struggles of the life that God had called him to. As we close tonight, I just want us to be encouraged. You know, it can be a struggle to live the life God has called us to. God has not called us to a life of comfort. He's called us to a life of purpose and a life of challenge. And and we should be thankful for that, but it's not always easy. But he also gives us the encouragement and the tools we need to be successful in the life that he's called us to. Would you bow your heads? Would you close your eyes? As we close here in invitation, I would encourage you, if the Lord is speaking to your heart, maybe you're discouraged like Paul was. Maybe you're struggling, you're being tempted to quit in whatever ministry God has placed you into. I would encourage you, look at the truth of God's word. Be encouraged by his presence. As we pray together, you speak to the Lord. Ask him to give you that strength, that courage that he offered to Paul. Lord, I thank you for tonight. And Lord, more than that, I thank you for the fact that you are a God who is with us. You're a God who has called us to a big life, yes, but you've also given us the strength and the, the tools that we need to live that life. And I pray that you would help us as we go out as a church, that we would be mission-minded even here in our own city, and that you would use us to, to make a, different, a difference in our community. We thank you for all you've done. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Would you please stand with me? Turn to hymn number 494. 494, hymn 494. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after I appreciate you being here with us tonight. Reminder, those that are working in the three through six-year-olds will meet right afterwards up here in the choir loft. And uh, looking forward to seeing you next week, all right? Ty, would you mind just where you're at closing us in a word of prayer? Dismissed.